Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first event of Startup Grind of Kathmandu Valley Chapter. So it's basically a global startup community to educate, inspire, and connect entrepreneurs around the world. So now we are just focusing on Kathmandu and now Nepal so that we can connect the entrepreneurs from Nepal to Asia and all over the world. So this is our first event, so please accept our apologies in advance if there's technical glitches or if there's something wrong with the system because this is the first time we're using this system as well. So today we are hosting Amun Thapa, who is the founder and CEO of Sastudil. And as most of you already know about him, and most of you have used his services already now because of pandemic, everyone's starting to order online rather than going to the shop. So it's boom for the e-commerce. So Amun Thapa, who is also leading uh, social venture like KaliCC.com and Anthropos, he's the co-founder as well. So I will uh, let uh, Amun Thapa speak about his journey as an entrepreneur and how he started Sastodil and the story of Sastodil, because he'll be the best person to know than uh, other people about his personal story. So Amun Thapa. Hi, Tenzing. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this uh, prestigious program and congratulations on your first uh, event here in Nepal, Tenzing. Uh, just to uh, talk about uh, Sasta Deal, uh, it's Nepal's uh, one of the leading uh, local e-commerce companies. So we started way, way, way back in 2011. So, you know, like when we started uh, Sasta Deal, the internet penetration in Nepal was just about 9%. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, like we had to go through a lot of hardship, uh, trying to educate the market, trying to convince the vendors to onboard the products, uh, trying to educate the customers to buy and shop online. Uh, you can imagine even today there are skeptics out there, but uh, back in 2011, you know, like no one uh, trusted online. No one even had an idea because like, if, Talking about if just 9% of the entire country had access to internet. So e-commerce was something that was an alien uh, world to all of, them, all of them, right? So uh, so we had a very humble beginning. So uh, when I came back from US, uh, uh, one of the first incidents that I had to personally go through was, you know, like well, trying to buy a pair of boots. Uh, I end up spending almost seven to eight hours in the market, you know, like yeah. somebody tells you to go to New Road, someone tells you to go to Barbatini, you know, like, uh, so that night when I came back home, uh, I realized, you know, like, and a big question uh, that I asked myself that very night was, is it just me or is this, it's, it's the entire country that's having to go through this? What if I have to buy another pair of shoes or a sock? or a book or you know like so people end up spending like five six hours just like that you know like so that's when i knew e-commerce was something that's desperately needed uh, in a country like nepal especially that you know like for all of us living in Kathmandu, uh, we have a rather easy life we have access to market and all that but imagine someone uh, in a place like sulkhet or Rolpa, Rolpa or Solokumbu, they have no market at all right they have to climb down a heel or walk three, four hours to come to the nearest marketplace with limited SQs. So, you know, like uh, then I knew e-commerce was needed, but the problem was uh, I didn't come from an e-commerce background. So I am a student of consumer psychology and uh, marketing. Yeah. Uh, so I immediately knew I had to uh, hire uh, someone or some company to get this done. Uh, so when I initially uh, went out in the market, uh, trying to identify uh, a web, web designing and coding company. Like the quotation they gave me was almost four lakh, five lakhs, whereas uh, what I had at the time was just 50,000 rupees. So there's no way I could afford that. And uh, nobody trusted me, like not even my friends uh, trusted in online. So I could not raise money uh, back in 2011. So rather than giving hope, uh, I just, you know, like tried my luck. Uh, in finding two, uh, I mean, so these people are my co-founders today. So two individuals uh, were good in website designing and coding. So when I reached out to them, you know, like literally what I told them was, look, this is the idea. This is what's going to happen five to ten years down the road. Uh, this is. What 
export world, uh, but I don't have money to pay you for a year, for two years, I don't know how many years, but I don't have money to pay you. But all I have is this idea and I want you to be co-partners uh, in this company, right? So like looking back, I don't know why they agreed, but luckily like uh, a couple of weeks later, they came back to me and said, you know what, uh, we're in, so we want to try this out. So that was, uh, I was very lucky in that sense that these people were earning good income freelancing for other companies and was, was making like at least you know like 100,000 200,000 a month uh, in Nepali rupees and, yeah. and now all of a sudden they were about to quit all of that uh, come to me as a stranger uh, with this strange idea of an e-commerce company and uh, that's how we formed a team right so with 50,000 obviously we didn't have uh, capital to even uh, rent a good office so what we did was we found a garage uh, that was located in this place called Gari Dara. So, for Nepali audience that's out here today, like that's uh, near to Alice Rishwan in, in Gari Dara, right? So, it was a small uh, garage. Uh, the rent price offered was rupees 2000. Uh, so, $20 a month. Uh, that's what we agreed, and I negotiated very really hard for that. And so, that's uh, where our first office was, you know, like in a, literally in a garage. So then I didn't even have money for furniture uh, to buy chairs and office tables. So what I did was, you know, like there was a nearby NGO and in the ground uh, there, there was some broken furniture. I thought they was just laying there for some time. So I thought they were, you know, like the NGO had no use of them. So I just took it. So call it, you know, like donation or I stole it from them. But uh, so I took some broken chairs and one big uh, desk that we used for almost two years uh, at such a deal. So we had a guy, uh, an old man, who used to often visit our office. He used to, he was a repair guy, so he used to fix our furniture. So whenever there was need, there's need for some repairment, uh, we used to call him. So we used to pay him 50 rupees, so that's $5. So every month I used to call him. So instead of buying a new chair, we like repair the existing broken chairs every now and then, right? So that's, that's how we, started such a deal, it was a very really humble uh, beginning. Uh, me as an entrepreneur as well, you know, like what they say, an entrepreneur wears all hats. That's what I did. So my role as a CEO or the founder of the company was to go out there in the market while my two other colleagues were uh, staying back at the office to build the website. So I would go out in the uh, market, uh, try to convince vendors. Most of them laughed at me, most of them question me about what e-commerce, what online, what internet, like those are the questions uh, back then. And then like finally, if I had uh, one or two deals, I'd come back and then uh, take my camera, go back, take the photographs, write the content, and then upload it in the content. And if there's some orders, then I'd be the one to deliver it uh, to the customers as well. So, you know, like, and then whenever there's, there's an order uh, through the phone, phone or social media or the website, as the one who entertained uh, the phone calls as well. So I did everything, you know, like from taking the phone calls to delivering the products, to writing the content, taking the photographs, to meeting the vendors. Uh, so everything, you know, like that's how we started uh, Sustil as a three-man uh, company, you know, like, and then uh, luck had by our side. Uh, so the industry was booming. Uh, the company was growing very, very fast. Um, so in no time, you know, like three people became 30 and that's how we uh, grew very, very fast. And I think in third year, we finally moved out uh, of that office space. Uh, but I still, you know, like visit that place whenever I feel I need that energy or, you know, like the purpose uh, to remind me why we started. So I usually go there and then office place, the garage is still intact. Uh, it's right next to Alice, and then uh, it's still painted in my uh, Sastril brand colors. That's teal and uh, purple, so you can still feel Sastril whenever you go there. You know, like so. So that's how we started dancing, like uh, in two thousand eleven. So with challenges, there are always opportunities because I believe that uh, most of developing countries, uh, they still like hasn't. The e-commerce and technology hasn't got that far. It's like they're all starting. So we, what do you think are the challenges and opportunities for startup growth of company in Nepal? So tell me like, uh, you know, like there's this quote uh, by Winston Churchill. Um, I don't know the exact quote, but what it says is, uh, 
never let a good crisis go to waste. You know, that, that's what he said. So, you know, like uh, if you look back uh, and study the biggest companies in the world or the most valuable companies in the world, everybody looks at their successes, right? But I, I want the audience to go back and research on their, uh, you know, like on the growth stage, like when they actually were in the struggling phase, right? And then you find a common thing among all these companies. I wouldn't say every company, but most of the companies that are on the top 10, on the top 20 list uh, in the world, uh, these companies were made or they made big when there was a crisis in the, in the world or in the, when there was a crisis in their own country. So that's a common thing, right? Uh, even like if we have to refer to our own uh, Binod Choudhury, who's the only billionaire in Nepal, uh, if you go back and read his interviews, he consistently, you know, mentions this thing that we invest whenever there's crisis. And that's very true. And, and my thoughts also align with these uh, people as well. You know, like crisis are the time when entrepreneurs should sign. Uh, because as an entrepreneur, the biggest difference between an entrepreneur and a businessman is a businessman, the only purpose for them to start a business is to make, you know, like rupees two to rupees four. They don't care about nothing else, right? But as an entrepreneur, that's not your uh, sole objective. Your objective is to solve a problem. Your objective is to try and go out there and, you know, like uh, make make uh, this challenge a big opportunity for not just you, for, but for the entire country and the entire world, right? So like crisis is the perf perfect uh, time and place for an entrepreneur to shine. So that's when, when we talk about challenges uh, in Nepal, and you know, like when I came back in Nepal, I was, I actually felt it was a gold mine. You know, like, so I started Sasta Deal and then uh, I went to start Sasta Book because no one was doing anything in the book domain. Uh, then I went on to, along with my colleagues, uh, started Anthropos. It's Nepal's first uh, sunglass company, right? With Anthropos, it's also a social motive company where every 10 pair of sunglasses that we sell, we support the cataract surgery of one uh, patient, right? Uh, in, the, in the rural area. So we've already supported almost 400 to 500 uh, cataract surgeries so far. And then recently, me and my wife, we started KhaliCC.com, that's in the West segment. So, there's so many uh, areas where, you know, like there are challenges and it's unexplored. And then whenever there's a challenge and it's an unexplored market, it's a gold mine, it's a gold rush, it's a green field for entrepreneurs. And that's what we believe, you know, like with challenges comes opportunities and there are real challenges in Nepal. And speaking in that context, you know, like a lot of uh, young audience, uh, what they ask me is like, how do you come up with ideas and how do you really come up with these solutions, you know, like uh, I've been thinking about so many ideas, but uh, normally these ideas are something that's already out there in the market. Uh, you know, like one advice or one uh, thing that I normally look at is, you know, the Indian market. If you really question uh, or start comparing Nepal to India, we're very much identical, right? So we're almost like Chelly Betty. Uh, we speak the list almost, we don't entirely, but we speak almost the same language. We watch the same television channels, we consume the same products, uh, we act the same way, we have similar demographics and everything is same other than India is way, 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 way ahead than Nepal in terms of uh, the startup ecosystem, in terms of technology, in terms of growth. In those areas, they've left us far behind, right? So what I encourage uh, Nepalese audience to do, Nepalese startup entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs to do is look at India. So what's happening in India and what's not there in Nepal. So if you compare these two countries, then you can immediately uh, get a sense of what's going to work in Nepal in the next five years. Uh, trust me, guys, it might not sound good for our country uh, for me to say this, but the, India is like five to seven years ahead than us, especially when it comes to like uh, our ecosystem, right? Uh, so that also gives us an advantage that if they're five to seven years ahead than us, then we can look at their learnings, we can look at their growth, we can understand uh, how they do their company and then pretty much adapt those ideas and those execution in Nepal as well, you know. And then uh, you can also do that with China, but although the language problem is a big problem, but India has millions of examples, so that's what we need to do. And the third point here would be, uh, you know, like Nepal desperately needs a local example. 
uh, and like at Sustadil, we are trying to be that example because you know, like for lot lots of uh, audience that we have here, like I understand most of, most of them are youths, and then it's a common thing that in every household they're trying to send off their children to Australia, UK, or US, right? And that's not wrong, you know. Like uh, I also went to US, I got that exposure, and I came back. I'm not saying that's wrong, but why that's happening is because for the parents. It's like they've not seen any example in Nepal or even for the children to defend themselves like, okay, I'm not going to go to Ashula because I've seen this company do good in Nepal. I'm going to follow their path and I can also do that. So they don't have that confidence because they have not seen that example, right? So Nepal, trust me guys, you know, we've always been uh, using Mount Everest, Gautam Buddha as our example and we feel very proud. But, you know, like these are, Mount Everest is a natural God gifted I uh, think there's nothing that we did to have Mount Everest and same to do with Gautam Buddha, right? So what is that we're doing today that we, we should be really proud of? Give me one example that as a Nepali we're really proud of. If you're talking about Mount Everest, Mount Everest Buddha and Gurkha, these are things of the past. Like I'm talking about today, you know, like in the past 10 years or 20 years, what is something that we're proud of? Nothing, nothing, right? So this is something that we desperately need in Nepal. Uh, some good examples, uh, some good, you know, like companies that people can refer to so that, you know, folks out there in the US or Australia or UK, they feel they want to come back home seeing that, yes, there are opportunities in Nepal. So and so companies, they've done it. So I also want to do it. And even for people staying in Nepal, they can tell their parents that these companies have done it. I can also do it. So we need those examples, you know. So those are also opportunities that we're talking to. And there are immense opportunities in Nepal. Uh, you can be an example to millions of youths out there. And that's what we should all be trying to do. Uh, that's very inspiring. It's like... Uh, most Nepalese people, they love to complain like, ah, oh, Nepal doesn't have this, there's lack of regulations, political instability and everything. So they tend to uh, go a little bit back and say like, oh, there's nothing in Nepal. Uh, it's better to go Australia, United States or foreign country to study and work there. But you came back yourself from the United States to Nepal because you saw opportunities in their challenges. But as you know, to be an entrepreneur is not easy. It's, it's easy to be an employee because you just go work get your salary, do what your boss says you to do. But as an entrepreneur, there's always so much challenges. There's lots of things that goes behind. Because what we see is like, oh, Sustodil, it's one of the successful e-commerce company. But we don't see what goes on behind. So I just want to go a bit more into your personal life to see like how you prepare yourself as an entrepreneur and what are the habits that you do. Because there's lots of challenges involved. You have to sacrifice a lot of things. There's lots of stress involved and there's lots of people who's going to say it's not going to work. So how do you manage that stress and how do you cope up with your personal life balance with your uh, sustadil, managing sustadil? So sure, uh, rightly put, um, you know, like uh, there's a lot of, you know, I always say this, uh, entrepreneurship is more personal than professional. Um, because professional is something that everybody can handle. You know, like the personal part is something that a uh, lot of entrepreneurs cannot handle. The stress, the sleepless night, the amount of pressure there is, the amount of responsibilities there is, the amount of failures you have to go through, the countless uh, number of answers to the questions that you have to answer from the board to the customers to your employees. So there's always, you're always surrounded by a lot of challenges, you know, and then that takes a lot of toll on you as a personal, you know, like human being. And at the end of the day, even your Steve Jobs or your Tenzing, like at the end of the day, everyone is a human being, right? Uh, so, so what makes it, what, what difference does it make, you know, like uh, to be an entrepreneur or to be an employee? I want to distinguish that because everybody plays a vital role uh, in the society, in the ecosystem. But honestly, you know, like, uh, you know, there's a quote, uh, I cannot quote it exactly, but it says something like this, you know, like what you do in the dark is what signs when you're in the light or what people look at you when you're in the light, right? So that's what an athlete does, right? So whenever an athlete, uh, they compete in like say a NBA pro or in the Olympics, right? So when they're running the 100 meter dash and people cheer for them, you know, like that, 
that part is just like 1% of the athlete, right? 99% is the practice, the hard work, all the commitment, all the struggle, you know, like, so all these are the things that people do not see, uh, you know, like they only see the 1% part. And every entrepreneur, they go through that. So my, you know, like uh, what I try to do on a personal note is the morning uh, ritual, I'll, I'll say, is very important. You know, like uh, what you do in the morning uh, sets you for the day and what you do in the weekend sets you for the month, right? So there are two things that I do usually on the weekend. I always like on a Saturday, if I'm not invited to any programs or such, always on a Saturday, I go for a short hike, uh, at least a three, four hours hike deep into the jungle. So I live uh, near to uh, Sivapuri uh, peak, right? So in Budanakanta, so it's a walking distance. So I always go there and then, you know, like whenever I enter the jungle, I feel like, you know, like all this rush, all this, you know, like uh, race, I'd say, and all this, and whenever I listen to the insects and this is the calm, peaceful noise, the waterfall, then I feel this is earth, this is life. What I've been doing for the past, you know, like five or six days, that's crazy, you know, like it's a mouse, it's a rat race, right? And that prepares me, you know, like for the week. So otherwise, you know, like if you're running seven days a week and then if you're racing for the entire life, then you're missing out on life. So at least on the weekend, I wouldn't, I wish I could do that for the entire life, but at least on the weekend, uh, I try to do that. So that really prepares me uh, for the day, uh, for the week. And usually in the morning, you know, like um, working out and what I do is like, I cannot meditate. You know, I've tried a lot trying to meditate. It's something that, you know, there's so much of distraction and things, I cannot do it. But what I follow is this thing called priming. Uh, so I really follow uh, this entrepreneur or coach, I'd say, uh, called Tony Robbins. So I'm sure a lot of you know him already. So Tony Robbins has this thing called uh, priming. So priming, uh, what priming means is, you know, like, uh, usually as a human being, what we do, like, we're always inclined towards stress. We're always inclined towards a lot of negative negativity we pinpoint on you know like some negative things that's happening on life and we zoom in and we focus on those part right and that's what uh, that's what life is for us but priming is something you know like we forget there's so many good things that's happening for us with us with our family for example like you know like we have such a beautiful life uh, we're doing good we're capable of uh, so many people out, out, out there in the streets, at least we have a home. You know, these are the things that you should always appreciate. That's the number one thing that we can do while trying to uh, do practice priming. Second would be, what excites you the most? Normally, we don't ask these questions, right? So what is something that makes you, you know, like wake up from bed just like that and get to work, right? So this is something that I'd say 99.9% people on planet Earth don't think about. What excites you? No one, everybody feels like, oh, I have to go to work, I have to do this, I have to like, when is this day gonna be over? And I'm gonna come back to bed. If that's life, then you know, like, it sucks. You know, like, so what priming teaches you to do is you have to think about every morning, you think about one thing that really excites you. So for example, if uh, for substitute, we're launching a new product or we're about to launch a Dasi campaign and it's a big campaign for us. And then, then I think about that, right? So after, and I think about the end, you know, like a successful campaign that's going to happen. And then that really excites me. Or, you know, like recently up until Flipkart a partnership was announced, I was very excited, you know, like Flipkart is going to come to Nepal. We're going to partner with Flipkart and Walmart. Uh, and then that kept me excited. You know, so every morning I have to think about it. So priming is very important, you know, like to appreciate what you have in life, to think about what is, what are the, some of the most exciting things in your life. And you just do it for five minutes and it energizes you, you know, like then six o'clock in the morning, you feel like you want to take on whatever comes throughout the day and it really, you know, like sets you for the day and then you have to work out uh, to keep. So, you know, like I usually uh, divide my life in four quadrants. So it's personal, spiritual um, and professional and mental, right? So, so, you know, like professional is everything to do with work uh, and that's not everything in life. You know, like, and uh, mental is something like, you know, with priming and everything, you also have to exercise your brain, you have to prepare your brain. Spiritual is something, you know, like, a uh, lot of times we forget, it's not just about God and trying to, you know, like, 
uh, stay connected with God. It's also about community. You know, what are you doing for the community that you feel good? Everything should not be about you. you know? So, so recently, you know, and I also wrote this on Five Things SD, which I usually write on Fridays. You know, so in Five Things SD, I mentioned today, just today, this morning, about a project that I'm working on uh, called the Pasupatinath project. So, what I came to know is like, you know, like for a lot of Nepalese, especially in the rural communities, uh, their dying wish, you know, for a lot of elderly, their dying wish is to like before they die at least once like they want to visit uh, Pashupatina, right? That's what their dying wish. But a lot of people cannot make it to Kathmandu because they don't have someone to take uh, take them there or they don't have the resources. What the capital these are simple things, right? So that's when I said I'm going to do this project as a side project and uh, it's something that can be easily done even if I help like 500 people a year and to uh, get them actually, to visit uh, Pasupatinath and that's something that did good and that's too and I'm being selfish here trying to you know like fulfill my spiritual side you know? so it's not always about professional you know like uh, Flipkart, Walmart, 100 crore review this that it's not it should not always be professional you know like you have to take care of the mental you have to take care of your spiritual you have to take care of your health you know like so you have to always divide life in four quadrants right so morning ritual and all of this are very important and at the end of the day, you know, like this, the list is so long, but just to cut it short, you know, like learning is something that we tend to forget after the academics is done. And uh, we believe, you know, like after our BBA or our master's, like we're done for life. But no, life is learning. You know, like the metaphor for life is learning. You have to always learn. No one individual can learn so much that they're done. You know, like especially if you are an entrepreneur or if you want to be a successful entrepreneur then you as an entrepreneur you are a natural leader right so to lead you should be able to guide people properly and to do that you should be able to have that wisdom to guide so so for that you know like what you do in the dark this is something that what i do in the dark regardless of how busy the schedule is i always find at least a couple of hours a day to make sure to read books uh, to read articles, to research about people. So learning should not always be about reading books, right? So there's so many books that I read, but it should also be about researching, you know, like, so like a lot of time what I do is I look at all these entrepreneurs and like what I said, what we know about these entrepreneurs are things in the superficial level, like right? we see their successes, but how many times have we really made that effort to learn about this, their hardship? So we talk about Richard Branson, right? We talk about Steve Jobs. We talk about all these people, right? Elon Musk and all. But when was the last time we actually tried to study what Elon Musk did while trying to, you know, like start his companies? What Steve Jobs did when he was trying to struggle or when he was uh, kicked out of his own company? What he actually did in those moments, right? So, so I think in that we find learning. You know, like a lot of times I try to read biography because. You know, like history is there, like there's so much of history that we can learn from. And all these great people from Winston Churchill to Mahatma Gandhi to anyone you name it, to any entrepreneurs, they've been through that. You know, what are you trying to do? They've already done it. So when you read about those people, then at a time when in your own life you feel like, okay, this is what I'm facing. This was what this guy also did back in 1900s or back in 1800s. So this is exactly how we, he responded to it. So I should also, you know, like go the same path. Or if he did it or if she did it, like I, should, I can also do it. So that's how you learn a lot from biographies and all that. And obviously there's technical books and all. Um, so, you know, like these, you know, like learning, the quadrant, the murdering ritual, the priming, and the hardship, you know, like at the end of the day, you have to put in 12 to 14 hours every day. You know, that's no successful people, uh, you name it, you know, like unless they have inherited from their uh, parents and grandparents, but no successful people have done it without working hard. These are the hardest working uh, people, all the successful entrepreneurs you've seen, these are the hardest working people. And by working hard, you may really mean working hard, you know, like you have to put in like, consistently like I'm not just talking about one day or one week or one month consistently 14 years or 20 years you have to put in your heart and soul and your sweat and everything to whatever you're trying to work and then you know like if you can manage all of this uh, then definitely you know like whatever you're doing it's definitely going to be successful 
Uh, thanks for your sharing your personal story. I just want to ask a question in regards to, like, uh, as you said, like learning is a lifelong journey. It's just, it does not end when you get your bachelor or master's degree. Uh, you might be reading lots of books. Is there any books that you think might be helpful for entrepreneurs that really inspire you? Yeah, so I think a lot of books. Um, um, I think book, I mean, it depends from people to people, but like I said, biographies um, are usually helpful. So in my own domain, uh, I've read multiple times about Amazon's or Jeff Bezos um, biography, Alibaba's uh, biography. And, um, you know, there's this book I really, really like. Uh, it's named Hard Things About Hard Things. So, uh, so the book, you know, like a lot of books, they talk about fancy things about starting a company and doing this and that, but hard things about hard things, it talks about the most difficult uh, part of uh, being an entrepreneur, right? For example, a chapter in the book is dedicated uh, towards how do you fire your best friend? So imagine, you know, like you've started this company with the best friend and that's what usually happens, but down the road, you realize he or she is not good enough for the role, right? and then there's someone better in that role. So how do you tell your best friend that you're fired? You know, so there's a book dedicated for, so it's about hard things about hard things, right? The toughest decision an entrepreneur has to make because as an entrepreneur, you're always making the toughest decision because there are managers below you and then below the manager, there are the officers and below the officers, there are representatives, right? So whenever there's a problem, it usually goes up the, the ladder, right? So usually it's the managers who try to answer or tackle the problem but if they cannot they pass it up and they can pass it up and then when the problem comes to us as a ceo or as a founder uh, as the management in company these are the problems that usually no one else in the company has had uh, tackled it or had uh, you know like had the solutions for it so then every day all these problems are being thrown at you the problems that are the hardest out there so then you have to make those uh, choices so how do you do that you know like, so i really like this book Hard things about hard things. Another book I'd definitely recommend a lot of people to read would be Blitz Scaling. So that's by Reid Hoffman. Uh, so he's a founder, co-founder of LinkedIn. So Blitz Scaling is about, you know, like, uh, so there is a quote from the book and, you know, like I cannot exactly say the quote, but it some, says something like, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, like when you're jumping off the cliff, that's when you build an airplane. So, you know, like you do not, as an entrepreneur, you do not have time to sit and build an airplane. You know, like you jump off a cliff and by the end you build an airplane, you fly. If you don't, you fall and you die. And that's what that's the moral of the book, right? So bit scaling is about scaling fast. So especially if you're in a technology company, you don't have 50 years to build a company, to grow your company. You're not Dabur. You know, you're a tech company. You have five years and do whatever you can in five years and beat those companies like Dabur and all. And that's what Amazon and Facebook has shown, you know, like in the past 10 or 20 years, they've beaten companies who've been there out for like 100, 200 years, right? So Walmart and all these companies that has been there for 1800 years, Amazon came in and, you know, like now you, where is Amazon, where is Walmart, right? So so that's what Blitzkilling is all about. So I really recommend Blitzkilling, hard things about hard things, uh, any biography that you can read, and political, you know, like I have a book that's on the, you know, like I'm not a big fan of Modi, but anyway, uh, is one election in a country like India, right? So that's the biggest uh, democratic nation out there. And it's fun to read and it's it's a good learning experience to read about how Modi won that election, right? So to read, I mean, just read whatever you can grab on. Uh, and I usually try to avoid self-help books. Uh, those are ridiculous, you know, like I don't like self-help books, but uh, really like to pick on these books that are uh, written by entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, so that they talk about their own experiences. So always good to learn from someone else's experiences. Uh, as you know, the technology is changing rapidly. The regulations are changing. Everything around the world is going digital and everything is going pretty quick. What do you see happening next five, 10 years in the startup ecosystem? Oh, that's a really good question, Tenzing. Um, you know, like if we, Think about this, right? Five, 10 years or 20 years, that's a long, long time. We usually take five, 10 years as granted, you know, like five, 10 years, 15 years, but 20, five, 10 years or 20 years, you know, like if you look at these companies, for example, Amazon or Facebook, 15 years back, there was no Facebook, none, right? 
20 years back, you know, like Amazon was just starting out, Google was just starting out. Right? So in 20 years or 15 years, these companies, they've changed the entire world from, you know, like our own culture to behavior, to technology, to impact, to, you know, like uh, these people, I mean, these companies in the past 10 or 15 years or today, like Netflix, Knowledge, you know, they've changed the entire world in the past 10 or 15 years. So when we think about the next 10 or 15 years, it's going to be even more fast. The changes are going to be even more fast. The tech companies are going to disrupt the world. And now it won't take 20 years. It'll just take two years. It'll just take five years. You know, so that's when I recommend a lot of uh, tech companies to think about grid scaling. So don't think about in 10 years, I'm going to do this. Talk about what are you going to do in the next 10 months? Right. So what other companies can achieve in the 10 years, you should achieve in 10 months. That's what we should really be going for. So in that context, and that's the attitude of any technology companies, especially out there in China or US or India in particular, right? These companies are trying to go very, very, very fast and disrupt whatever it is. So there's going to be a lot of uh, changes in, in a lot of areas, especially AI will disrupt everything. Um, I'm sorry if there are any accountants here, like in the next 10 years, uh, AI will replace all the accountants in the world. There's no need for accountants, right? That's gonna happen. AI will disrupt, but it will also uh, create more opportunities for new kind of jobs. So that's also gonna happen, okay? It's not that they're gonna replace human beings. So AI will disrupt the world. Uh, definitely, you know, like in terms of agriculture, in terms of uh, space, uh, so there's a lot of now, we're going back to 1960s when there's a space race, right? So everybody is trying to go to the moon to mine resources, not about reaching the moon. They want to mine, you know, like the resources that's out there in the moon. Uh, SpaceX is after the entire space. So recently, if you've been following, Elon Musk uh, he launched uh, uh, this first kind of internet satellite. So he tweeted from, you know, like the satellite. So what, what he's going to do is, you know, like the satellite is going to throw out fast uh, internet in the entire world. So, so that's going to definitely change. Uh, so when the entire world has access to fast internet, it'll change a lot of areas, right? In terms of health and everything, you know, like doctors today in a lot of leading countries, they don't even have to go to the hospital. They can perform surgeries while people are in an ambulance to, to the hospital. In the ambulance itself, they can operate the patient, right, so to, to save a lot of lives. So these are definitely going to change. In terms of our own, you know, like in Nepal, uh, a lot of areas like tourism, agriculture, food uh, and all, you know, like, uh, so technology will have a drastic impact because Nepal in all of these sectors is 50 to 100 years behind. You know, like none of the technology has really been used in all of these areas. Imagine when they use the amount of efficiency that's going to go up. Right, so everything I can see in the next five to ten years is going to happen, and a lot of startups are now working on it. Uh, especially the startups or the people that have traveled abroad, they've seen that in agriculture, especially a lot of people go to Israel and they study agrotech. They come back and they're, they're not trying to introduce that to the farms here, right? So in terms of irrigation or agriculture and all that. So a lot of traditional industries are going to be disrupted. Uh, for example, also with Kali CC, uh, the waste industry, so the boring waste industry that's been there for almost 100 years in the same fashion, right? So with Kali CC, we're trying to disrupt that through uh, technology. So, so let's all just see about or talk about the global impact. And locally, we're going to have a lot of impact uh, as well in terms of technology. And that's what excites me the most, you know, like I mean, what's going to happen in the next five to eight, 10 years. And going back to learning, that's when an entrepreneur should be, always be ahead in the game so all of these changes are happening so fast you cannot be your follower you cannot you know like when the technology is introduced you cannot be your follower and say wow look at that startup or look at that technology why aren't you the one to introduce that in nepal a because you do not have a clue that that was there and b you're not forecasting you know like what's going to happen in the next five to ten years a lot of people look at what's happening today a lot of people jumped into e-commerce recently uh, you know, uh, seeing what Daraz, Alibaba, or Australia is doing in the market, right? But, you know, like, none of them had this vision back in 2011. So now when people are jumping into e-commerce, I'm already seeing, like, 10 years ahead, like, what's going to be the next disruptive technology, right? So you should always be looking at 10 years ahead. Don't look at what's happening now, right? 
if you're looking at now, then you're jumping into a red ocean that's already filled with competitors, a lot of sharks. Uh, you know, like try to get into a blue ocean, and the only way to get it is get to a blue ocean is you know, like you read a lot, uh, you follow what's happening in the world very closely, very passionately, not just for the sake of doing it. You follow them really closely, and then you you have that guts. You know, like at the end of the day, you need that guts. A uh, lot of people, there are a lot of naysayers, and there's another quote for that. Ignore the naysayers, you know, when the naysayers are loud, turn up the music, you know, like when they keep on, you know, like telling you no, 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 then that's when you go out there and show them, you know, like, okay, fine, this is what I'm going to do. And that's what I did, you know, like back in 2011, when majority of the people, if, including my friends, when they said, you cannot do this, this is ridiculous, you're a stupid guy. That's when I said, I'm going to go out there and prove them wrong. And that's what I did, it's, you know, so when the naysayers are loud, turn up the music. So, you know, like there's a lot of exciting things out there, but look into the horizon five to 10 years down the line. That is a must uh, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur. Yeah, good to know that. Yeah, as you know, like the technology disruption is going to change the world. You have to adopt or you might be left behind. So you have no options. And uh, what I've seen recently in Nepal is lots of young entrepreneurs, they want to stay in Nepal and want to do something like they want to start their own business rather than going overseas, like doing our time. Most of the people have finished their high school. They want to go to Australia, United States or UK or other country to study. But now I've seen lots of trends saying like, oh, there's lots of opportunities here. Maybe they're looking at the example of Sosta Deal or Total and say like, oh, they have done it. Why can't we do it? So what advice do you have for those young entrepreneurs or the one who wants to be an entrepreneur after they finish their high school or graduate? So I think, I think um, what's lagging in Nepal is uh, thinking big. Uh, obviously, Nepal being a landlocked con country and going back to what I said, you know, like there aren't many examples out there to refer to. And people have not seen that, you know, like when reading in a textbook, we study case studies about companies that's abroad. We talk about Walmart and Facebook and Google and whatnot. But there's not even a single case study on a local Nepali company, right? So that's when, you know, like uh, when that limits everyone to think big. So they don't, they cannot really do that. Whereas if you look at Indian people, if you look at any foreigners, they're always thinking big. They're always in there, you know, they're talking about big things. They're talking about big numbers. They're aspiring for big things, you know, like, so my advice to a young audience would be, you know, like at the end of the day, everyone has 24 hours in a day, right? So it, it's in that 24 hours, what you do matters the most. Because everyone, like be it Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, or you, or a Nepali young entrepreneur, that's 20, no one's going to get 25 hours, right? Everyone's going to get 24 hours. So in that 24 hours, if you're just thinking about starting a shop, a local shop, and not thinking about going to Mars, okay? So I'm not even talking about, you know, you have to think about going to Mars, but look at how these uh, smart entrepreneurs are doing. They're going after big dreams because they know they have limited time on planet earth and in that time they have to go after big things otherwise it's useless you know like what are you doing so like you don't have to think about mars but at least think about big at least think about entire country don't think about your community or uh, five or ten you know like kilometers think about like even like nepal or india and big things right so in second you know like what i realize a lot of people don't want to think big because they don't want to fail but have that attitude, you know, like I have this quote uh, uh, in my attic that says, fail big. You know, and keep, I keep reminding myself to fail big. And so that two words, you know, like really motivates me because one, I'm telling myself to fail. You know, like a lot of times as an entrepreneur, you're trying to go the other way around. You're not trying to fail. And if you're not trying to fail, then you're not attempting new things. You're not trying out new things. And then the second word is big. So fail big, you know, like if you want to fail, don't just fail small, you know, fail big. <laughs> like do a billion dollar project and fail, like so what, you know, do it. Like what's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to end up in road and find out another way to come back up, right? So fail big, you know, that's what a lot of Nepalese audience needs, you know, like a big thought and to, the attitude to fail so that if you have that, what's the worst that's going to happen? And that gives the drive. Uh, to, you know, like go after bigger things in life. And that's what Nepal needs, a bigger example, bigger things, bigger attitude, bigger personality and bigger startups.
Thanks for your encouraging story. Uh, we will go Q&A session. So we might take a few questions before you go. Uh, I'll just have a look at questions. Can you see the question? Uh, so we have a question here. Uh, please try to make your question a little bit shorter so that it's easier to put. Uh, yeah, Anil Thapa says, I'm starting an online business e-commerce. What are its scope and how does this business work? Please share us the details. So how do you think the e-commerce business mm -hmm. works and what are the scope? Considering there's already few players in the market. So Anil, um, my advice to you would be, you know, like, uh, a friend one, once asked me not a long time back, uh, how much capital does it take to start an e-commerce uh, company? And then my answer was, you know, like you can even do it in less than rupees thousand and you cannot even do it in more than 10 crores. You know, like uh, the industry has become so big that uh, you now really have to focus what you really want to go after. You know, like for companies like Sastadil and Daraz, uh, we've managed to build a company and a brand name and millions of followers and thousands of vendors uh, work on technology that takes, you know, like millions and millions of dollars of investment. To be very honest, you know, like I'm not trying to discourage you here. I'm just trying to be honest. Um, so, you know, like to compete directly would obviously, you know, like I appreciate that, but it obviously means there's a lot of chances to fail, right? So my suggestion would be, you know, like if not directly e-commerce, E-commerce has a lot of verticals. There's B2C, there's B2B, there's a lot of C2C. And if you look at C2C, right? So uh, customer to customer e-commerce, there's only one player out there in the market, Hamra Bazaar. You know, like there's no, none other uh, e-commerce platform. Maybe you can, you know, like have a go at that. But there's, you know, like to support e-commerce, there's a lot of adjacencies that's not there in the market. You know, a logistic company, for example, if I want to deliver, if my company wants to deliver within one hour across the nation, I cannot do it because there's no particular loss company that has the capacity to do that, right? So maybe you can start a loss company that can do one hour delivery. Then, you know, like Daraz and Sustin both would be jumping to get your business, right? Uh, maybe other verticals around to support e-commerce businesses. But if you want to directly come to this industry, you know, like there are already so many players uh, out there with big investment, big capital. So unless you have that in mind that yes, I'm going to compete in terms of technology, capital, resources and all of that, because you know, like you're already 10 years behind. So Sustil started uh, almost nine years back. So we have a nine years lead in the market. Uh, Daraz, Alibaba, you know, like they've been the pioneer in the entire e-commerce sector in the world itself. So they are always ahead. Uh, so when you're competing with these two companies in particular, you're always behind. So, so what's your plan to catch up? Unless you have that plan in mind, uh, then I wouldn't advise you to straight away start an e-commerce company, but you can start companies to support uh, those functions or an e-commerce vertical that's not there. Or maybe even like you can even think of a niche, you know, like if you want to really go give it a try, a niche e-commerce uh, focusing on just a particular segment, right? So for example, in India, there's this company called Paper Fry, which is doing so good, but they're only focusing on furniture, right? So as an e-commerce platform, we cannot do everything. Our expertise doesn't lie in every category. So we do have furniture, but people fry, they, you know, like they have the best furniture. They know how to do the installments. Their salespeople are trained uh, towards that. So you can focus on niche uh, segments as well. You know, like that is also a possibility. Thanks, Aman. Uh, there's another question saying uh, it's a bit long, but uh, it says the conversation is centered around Western ideas of entrepreneurship, uh, but we live in a different social cultural context with different set of values and tradition. Uh, how do you, how does our shared narrative save entrepreneurship? So I think, uh, yeah, I think so that's what I was also referring to. Um, you know, like Nepal does not have local examples, so hey, we need to have that example. So hoping to see such a deal in the next five years, we become that example for a lot of uh, new startups, right? So B, uh, as referring to India, right? You know, so so like, let's not even look at US companies or Silicon Valley companies, let's look at Indian startups. You know, like all these companies that are out there, 
that is not good in India. So going back to my earlier statement, India and Nepal were so close to each other. We think alike. We use the same products. You know, we behave the same way. We have the same markets. You know, like uh, the same behavior in terms of all generations, right? So, so if something is working in India, it should definitely work in Nepal. So if you look at Indian startup and how they've evolved and how they've managed to raise funds and execute their businesses and compete in global markets, and that's that's the same way that we can also do. Second, like in technology companies, you know, like there's no border. Uh, the biggest disadvantage for a country like Nepal is we're a landlocked country, right? But that was a disadvantage until we were focused in trading and importing and distributing and all that, you know. But now that we're focusing on technology, and technology has no border. You can you can you know like sell the services to anyone in the world, like be it in Czechoslovakia like, yeah, or you know like in Scotland or in US. You can sell it to anyone. Uh, I recently came up with a, this. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a viable app or what, but it's a Jyotis app that a lot of US uh, people has been using. And that's a Nepali app, uh, and you know like what they do is you know uh, there's foreigners are uh, they're big fans of Jyotis and all that, uh, and you know like so Yogi and all that. So so what these Jyotis do per hour they charge it, and you know like there's a, the customer is in the US, uh, the Jyotis are here in Nepal. You know like with the app. It has no border, so that's how we should also be thinking. But especially if you're in a technology uh, business, like eliminate the border and go after global audience. Thank you, Amit. Uh, the other question centers around employees. So it's like, what are the role of employees in startup, and how do you see the contribution of employees during your startup days? Uh, how do you select the employees when you start up? So I think um, to be very honest, uh, your employees are the ones that makes your company or breaks your company. Uh, how you treat your employees, that's exactly how they're going to treat uh, your customers as well, right? Uh, so for Sustadil, you know, like we're the first company or the only company in our domain uh, was given ESOP uh, to all the employees. ESOP means employee stock options. So what I truly believe, or what my management and board truly believes is, an employee is also a part owner of the company. You know, like. Especially like if for most of the companies, an employee, they devote the prime time uh, of their life towards the company. So most of them are in the, you know, like prime is of 23 years old to 30, 35, right? So from 23 to 35, you're talking about their prime is when they have the most energy, when they're most passionate, when they are learning a lot of things, you know, like you're not talking about a 50 year or 60 year old employee who are like, ah, I just want to go home. Talk about these energetic people, right? So if you're using their prime time for your company, better make sure they're also gaining from it, right? So you cannot just rip, rip off their prime time and when they look back after their future, like whatever, done nothing, like I just earned 20,000 rupees a month and that was it. They should not do that. So what we did was we introduced ESOP. So every employee of the company who have spent at least three years in the company are also part owners of the company. So they have a stock value. So when the company does good, their value also increases. So they feel a part of the company and that's what we are doing. And that's what I encourage everyone else to also do because don't treat your employees as employees, uh, treat them as partners. And that's what we do. Uh, yeah, thanks, Oman. Yeah, I think that's what happens in overseas as well. Like most of the startup company, they have employee stock options so that they become part of ownership as well. Because it's it's a risk the employee took while working in startup rather than working in a big organization, so they get reward as a stock options. Uh, the other question was regarding how do you increase users in how do you increase your users? That means how do you increase your customers during the starting days of such deal? Whether whether there was any marketing strategy or whatever uh, you did to increase your user. So telling, um, I think in a country like Nepal, the advantage that we have. Uh, is it's a small market, right? So we're not talking about India, you know, like um, Delhi itself is like almost one crore population. That's like almost the entire Nepal, uh, one, one particular reason. Right? So we're not talking about India, we're talking about Nepal. So we don't have to go after TVCs or radio or, you know, like print and spend like millions and millions of rupees just like that. Uh, if you're like a genuine entrepreneur, just think through in a market like Nepal, or especially if you're targeting Kathmandu, Pokhara, Dara, and all these major cities, <clears throat> it's a small market. So storytelling should be your ultimate marketing strategy. How you build word of mouth. 
Um, that's what you should be doing. You know, like if you look back on, uh, in all of these popular startups, like if you're talking about Sasta Diesel uh, or Daraz or Tutol or Patao, all these companies are doing, you know, like or all these other companies like Food Mario, Food Mandu, all these companies are what they're doing uh, the most is they're trying to create word of mouth so that, you know, like you tell your friends or your family, hey, uh, have you seen this in this company or is this company is doing this or whatnot? You know, so and then, you know, like I understand when Tuto was introduced in Nepal, uh, I heard it through a friend and I can understand, I can imagine uh, you've also heard it through somebody else, like instead of an advertisement, right? So have you heard of this company called Tuto? You can do this, right? So you need to create uh, that atmosphere or that kind of services that people can talk about or some kind of campaigns that, you know, like people instantly talk about. For example, when Kali CC came into the picture and trust me, you know, like Kali CC has almost near to zero marketing uh, budget. But what it does is it has story, you know, like of Kali CC people coming to the digital sector and how they've been doing it. And it has a lot of story and it has been, it's one of the most popular startups in Nepal because, and, and my wife, you know, like she was also, um, named uh, Forbes 30 and the 30, right? So not just in Nepal, she had a, a good buzz going in, in, in the entire world, right? So it's because of the story, you know, like the storytelling has to be so crisp and fine that people talk about it. And then that's free marketing for you, right? So in this country like Nepal, when you say, you know, like tomorrow is in Nepal Band, and then like few people talk about Nepal Band, Nepal Band, and actually it will happen, you know, like the Nepal Band will actually happen. We'll live in a country like that. The word of mouth is so fast, you know, like you don't even need a national media to uh, advertise. That's what you should be focusing, especially as a startup. Thank you. And the next question is from Arjun. It just says, what are the major administrative and legal issues you are facing as an e-commerce company? And what do you used to see change regarding the same? So that's a really good question, uh, Arjun. Like e-commerce, uh, to be honest, uh, Nepal government has just been focusing on e-commerce for the past two years. So entire, you know, like when we started up until this moment, uh, there was not even an industry, you know, like e-commerce was not even an industry. And that's, you know, like a lot of people think, you know, like when there is no industry, it's in a gray area and you should not enter that industry. That's wrong, you know, like when there is a gray area, that's when you should enter the industry because then you're a free bird, right? So as long as you're ethical and morally correct, you can do whatever you want and you'll see later what the government will come after you or not. Right? But today, uh, e-commerce is one of the most regulated uh, industries, especially, you know, like since there's a lot of hacks uh, that's happening. So we understand we're responsible for millions and millions of people's uh, data, personal information, their home addresses to everything, you know, like what they're buying. What, uh, so, so now the government has understood and then the transactions has also gone up. So, you know, like three, four years back, there's a small industry, but today we're talking about billions and billions of rupees uh, floating in the market in e-commerce segment, right? So now the industry uh, regulation has become very strict. Uh, so what Nepal government has done is they have a national e-commerce strategy. So I was also part of the strategy committee. So we've drafted the strategy and we are one of few countries in the entire world we have we have a national strategy for e-commerce so not not a lot of countries have that you know like what it means is the country wants to drive e-commerce so it has a national strategy in terms of logistics payment internet connectivity data and all that so in that strategy it's and it's easily available in public domain as well so then you can uh, read about it so it talks about how e-commerce should come up uh, and especially focusing in terms of smes you know like uh, we truly believe and the government also believes that SMEs are the ones that are left behind in the digital age, right? So uh, almost there's so many thousands of SMEs that can contribute almost 30 to 40 percent of national GDP. But how do you bring them on board to e-commerce uh, platform so that their products are easily accessible in the entire country and, and the world as well, you know? So, so we've been uh, talking about that. So in terms of regulation as well, government is trying to come up with strict policies in terms of data, in terms of uh, complaints, uh, in terms of, you know, like what you can do as if there's a product damage. So, but we don't own that product, the uh, vendor does, right? So who's responsible? Customer is buying from you, but somebody else is selling on your platform, right? So how does that work? You know, so there's a lot of uh, harsh regulations that's coming up, uh, which is good for the industry, I'd say. And I'm sure, you know, like as the industry becomes bigger and bigger and 
what what we've been also witnessing happening in India, the e-commerce industry is one industry that's going to be heavily regulated. Uh, it's one of the most regulated industry, and that's what I am expecting uh, in Nepal as well. Thank you. Hope that answers your question. Uh, it says I don't know. It, uh, it's a bit personal, but it says, can you name some of your ex-employees and the contribution for Sasta Dim? So if you don't, <laughs> you don't then I can move on to the next one. Yeah, let's move on. Because there's too many employees. Uh, it says, uh, the Prasant Kumar says, how to form a good team, find a partner, someone who you can walk and trust up in? Because I think that's a challenge. Well, that's, a, yeah, that's a really, really good question because um, I mentor a lot of startups uh, in Nepal, Tenzing. You know, like, and uh, sadly, you know, like, there were so many good startups. I could tell immediately that like, this startup is going to be, you know, like, in the top of the industries. It's going to challenge all these giants that, that are in the industry. But what happened over the years was, you know, like, whenever you're starting a startup and then you have a team, right? So, and then in the first initial phase for the first three to six months or 12 months, everyone is excited and everyone is so eager to uh, take the company forward. But soon what he realizes is, you know, like in the 12th month or the next year, you're not earning anything, you know, like you don't have any money in your pocket. Uh, your family is questioning you, hey, you become an engineer for this, like what are you earning? Uh, go and get some job and all that, you know, like, so there's so much of pressure and special pressure to go abroad, you know, like parents are always trying to kick their children off the, out of the houses to go to Australia or UK or US, right? So there's already so much of pressure and you're not earning anything, your startup is not taking off. And that's when the team breaks, right? That's when your four member team or five member team, then everybody starts leaving you like, okay, this is too much for me, I cannot do it. Uh, my family needs my support in terms of finances and all that. And I completely understand, you know, like people have their own reasonings and it's okay as well, you know. So that's when the company breaks and then you as the founder or you as the idea initiator or the most passionate individual in the company, you're left alone and then you do say, okay, fuck it, you know, like I'm going to uh, also take a job and forget about my startup. And that's what happens to a lot of startups, you know, like when they reach the breaking point and they break. So, so when you now, now that you know this, uh, when you're starting and then forming a startup team, you should always look at their attitude, their background, you know, like uh, what they're going to do when the, the, then when the company is in the most challenging of times, you know, like are they going to stay ethical? Are they going to work it out? Because trust me, you know, like in such a deal, we've been through breaking times, you know, like a hundred times. So many times, you know, like I don't know what to do next. I could not sleep the entire night. But every time my team has come together and said, you know what, we're gonna uh, do this together. Like you're not alone. So I'm gonna do this. You're gonna do this. You're gonna do this. We're gonna take it forward. You know, like so. Then we've always managed to come through. And that's that's the confidence that I have as a founder in my team. That regardless of the challenges and the opportunities or whatever it is, or whenever Alibaba came to the market with all their fancy technology and all the big capital, I knew, you know, like. The only confidence that I had was in my team. Like regardless of anything, if Alibaba comes or Amazon comes or what comes, you know, like my team is there, and then this team can pull it through. And that's what happened as well. You know, like so right now we're fighting Alibaba, and then it's because of the team. So we've stayed through, you know, like all these years through hard times, and there are harder times I know down the road, and I know this team will stick through. So whenever you're looking for a founding team, that's what you need to look at. Like is this team? Is going to stay through difficult times because if you're judging a team from the exciting time when you're starting a company, everyone is passionate and everyone is staying late hours, then that's the wrong time to judge your team. You know, like so, just think through how they're going to react uh, when you're facing the most difficult times in the startup. I think we might have one last question that says, "Why are Nepalis in foreign countries having trouble buying from Nepali online sellers?" I don't think we did that worse. This is why Nepal is in foreign country having trouble buying from Nepali online sellers. I... So I think he's talking about uh, export. Uh, so that is something we need to work it out. Uh, I'm also trying to work out from this deal with Flipkart. So what I'm trying to do is, you know, like Nepali, uh, uh, all these local uh, reasons, especially in the rural companies, they have their own unique products, right? So if you go to mountain, they have mountain yak, mountain honey, you know, like if you go to Torai, they have their own spices and everything that. People in the world will crave for, but 
but right now the sellers they don't have a marketplace to sell those products they don't have the channel right so like i said you know like a lot of these problems are there because no one has addressed those problems it's funny to say you know like sustainable is trying to now you know like become the platform to make that happen so there's a billion populace in india so so how do i you know like export these products in india through flipkart channel so i'm trying to make that happen you know like but but questioning you know like what happened in the next last 50 years no one actually tried to address this nepal has always been an importing nation which was the easiest thing to do you know like we don't have to have this we import we don't have this we import but how about exporting you know like so but the question is rightly addressed it's because there's a lack of market market places like ours uh, there's lack of effort from entrepreneurs like ours uh, these sellers in the rural communities they cannot you know they don't have the expertise or the uh, resources to do it so we have to do it for them you know like so that's what i think in the next ten years that's what's going to happen as well we'll see a lot of export going up because a lot of these e-commerce company will start catering to global communities I hope that answers your questions. If no one has any questions, I like to end this Q and A session. And before we go, uh, thanks, Amun, for your inspirational story and making Sastudil one of the rising star example of Nepal that has got the attention of Flipkart, who, which is the billion-dollar company in India. So you managed to get. Them to work together with you. So I hope in future, uh, the Flipkart is selling stuff here in Nepal, the, the Indian product. So I hope the Nepalese prodigy, the Nepalese product, goes to India as well in terms of export, as you mentioned before. So uh, I hope everyone got inspired by the story of Amun Thapa. So the most important thing is you got to work hard. There will be challenges, and that's when uh, people, most people, give up when they have, when they come hard time, they give up at the time when they're supposed to. Stay still and move forward because that's the time that determines whether most of the startup goes down or it continues become successful like Sasta Deal and the other e-commerce startup here. Uh, uh, before we go, I like you to say something to the participant that gives them motivation and pump up with positive aspects so that after this conversation is over, they can go home and think. So, do you have any motivational code that you want to inspire them? To think when they go home, because most of the time we get inspired listening to events uh, with the uh, entrepreneurs like you, and then we go home. We remember till night, and tomorrow morning we wake up and we forget, and we just go back to our normal day-to-day -day operation. So, what suggestion do you have for that? Yeah, so, so there's a quote uh, that I really go by, and it says, um, "What's on the other side of fear? Nothing." So keep repeating it to, to yourself, especially you know, like when you're in front of the mirror. What's on the other side of fear? So nothing. You know, like a lot of times we don't do or we don't go after our big dreams because we fear. We fear a lot of things, right? Ask these things and keep repeating it to yourself. What's on the other side of the fear? Nothing. There's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to fear, right? So, so go after your dream, big dreams, man. There's nothing to fear. Uh, thanks, Amun, for your valuable time. I know you are very busy during this time because uh, the e-commerce has started to pick up during this pandemic. So uh, I would like to thank you for your valuable time. I hope all the participants has learned something from Amun and will uh, start new business in the future and believe that you can do something here in Nepal so you don't have to go overseas. If you dream big, you work hard, anything is uh, achievable. As you know that there are challenges here, but the opportunities lies more where there are challenges. So if you go to a developed country, everything is there. So it's very hard to compete and everything. But in Nepal, everything is starting, the tech, the fintech, the payment, the delivery and everything. So uh, don't lose hope. Uh, just go for your dream. And if, uh, the startup grind is one of the largest network of community around the world. So we try to educate, inspire, and connect between different entrepreneurs. And in future, we're trying to get like, the uh, Nepalese entrepreneurs connect with the overseas entrepreneurs as well. Like we might start with the Asian entrepreneurs. So we're trying to link the investor and entrepreneur, not just in Nepal, but in overseas as well. So uh, since this is our first event, we apologize if there was any hiccups or if we haven't met your expectations, but we are learning through as the Nepal is learning about the e-commerce market and everything. So hopefully next event, we're going to bring another inspirational speaker. So tune into our Startup Grind 
uh, in Facebook and uh, we'll be hosting more events. Uh, we are planning to do one a month. So uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Nizin Poon and Arjun Bhattarai, who is the new committee members in Startup Grind. So we are slowly uh, trying to make team bigger so that we can hold more events. Like now, because of pandemic, we're holding webinar. Uh, like Zoom is popular now. So in future, we're trying to hold, host the event that will be more like the, in physical location so you can have face-to-face -face conversation with the speakers and everyone. So thank you very much uh, with that. I'd like to thank Amun Thapa once again very much. And I wish you all the success for the future. I believe Sustudil can come ahead and beat Daraz and be number one in Nepal because this is the Nepali company, Sustadil company with the foreigners one. So I wish you all the best. So uh, good night, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye.